today uh, we're going to be uh, talking about in this panel, which will be live streamed, um, about uh, migration. Uh, I believe the official title is uh, the migra debunking the migration myth. And basically, we, migra migrants represent more than 3% of the world's population, um, but they present more than 10% of global GDP. And yet, public perception of migration uh, is increasingly polarized. We're seeing it around the world. Uh, policies in Europe, in the US, in Asia have, um, instead of aided uh, the integration and the reskilling of migrants, seem to have gone in a opposite direction. So we're going to be talking about this theme with our distinguished panelists, who I'll introduce. Um, we have Mohammed al Jonde, who is um, a Syrian refugee who's going to tell us about his tale now, and he's also a member of the board of uh, Garsa now in Sweden. Um, Sara Pantuliano, who is chief executive of the Overseas uh, Development Institute in the UK, and Achim Steiner, who is the administrator of the uh, United Nations Development Program in New York. Um, <clears throat> I would like to start with you, Mohammed, to launch us into this discussion. If you could tell us your story. Um, from 2013 when you left uh, Syria? Yeah, so as you all know, in 2011, a revolution happened in Syria. Uh, after a while, it became a civil war. My mom took part of this revolution and uh, she was protesting and because of that, she got arrested twice and then she received death threats. So we had to flee the country to Lebanon. In, 2000, in the end of 2013, we arrived to Lebanon for the first six months, I was volunteering with a group of Syrian people who lived in Lebanon before me in the Syrian refugee camps. And after long, I was only 12, so I was in the, in the camps, but I was mainly hanging out with the children because I wanted friends, you know. And after we were talking, and my parents usually asked me, like, hey, what, what do you guys talk about? Um, we were mainly talking about that we want, like, a space where we can sit, express ourselves, and all that. So uh, the idea developed to, for us to starting a school. And I was out of school. I, I wasn't in school for almost four years in Lebanon, so for all the time that I've spent in Lebanon. So I decided to start my own school. So in, 2000, in the mid of 2014, we initiated a school called Gherse, which is a sprout in, uh, in English, so a little tree. And, um, and now the school became an actual building. It became a real building. We have around 740 beneficiaries every six months. We work with 500 women, and now we're more focusing on women and adolescents, more than children. Um, and the children we work with are between the age of five to 12. We graduate them, we graduate the, the whole group of children every six months, and then we send them to Lebanese formal schools. So we've been running until, until today. The school's still running, so we almost graduated 7,000 people. Uh, but then I had to come to Sweden to migrate again, because the situation in Lebanon became really hard. You know, uh, the government regulations in Lebanon prohibit Syrians to work in any other field other than agriculture, uh, construction, and uh, house cleaning. Uh, so basically, a lot of the work that we were doing is concerned under the law, not legal, but we were able to lobby behind and get a politi like a political umbrella in Lebanon to protect us, in a sense. So, um, so in Sweden, we started something called Gersi Sweden which is a sister organization for the organization we have in Lebanon that we're gonna try to support our work in Lebanon. And uh, mainly people ask me is like, how did you start this when you were 12 years old? Well, anyone can really do it if you talk enough about what you're facing. I mean, as a refugee who fled the war, who's experienced war, experienced certain traumas, you need an escape, you need something to distract you. Uh, and then in, for my four years in Lebanon, the school was distracting me from all my problems. But when I moved to Sweden, I realized that problems are, those problems are still with me and I have to deal with them. And the only way I've dealt with them is talking with people. So nowadays, I still work in the school. I work, I tell about it. I try to find fund, uh, fundings. I try to find donors and all that. But I mainly work as storyteller. So I go around countries, hear people's story and talk about them. I was in Mexico a couple, uh, couple months ago. I was in South Africa a couple months ago. And I hear about the refugees there, about the indigenous people and what they face. And I make documentaries about them and tell stories. So that's basically what I do. I cope with my problems as a refugee by trying to understand the perspectives of other people on, um, on life, mainly. And I think that's really important. And, um, and that's what we try to teach our children and the women in there. 
And when those refugees actually dealt with their problems in Lebanon, they were able to attend our courses and they were able to, ex uh, to success those <coughs> courses really quickly. We have a training trainers courses. We, the first course we started, we trained only 12 women. Eight of them entered the workforce immediately after we finished. Uh, they worked as uh, general equality teachers <coughs> and on, as a civil rights teacher. Now we almost entered 100 women into the workforce. It's a small number, but it's growing. Um, and that's basically as my life as a refugee. It's been, it's been, it's been a crazy journey. Now, now I'm here, now in the World Economic Forum, um, trying to also accelerate the... Um, the development of my school and the development of refugees that I've met. So that's who I am. When, Mohammed, when you set up the school, the first school, which was about six months after you arrived in Lebanon from Syria, did you think it was going to be mainly about, you know, just getting people together as much a social aspect as a, you know, as something that would ensure that the that children uh, would continue to learn and would continue that would not therefore lose just just because they had to flee their country, they would lose a crucial part, crucial years of their education. What was the main purpose and what did it end up being? I mean, if you want me to be honest, I was only 12. Right. So, <laughs> so, it was, so it was mainly the social aspect of it. Uh, but of course, because as I said, I was out of education, I realized how important education is for the social aspect of education because schools are not only a place for you to learn how to read and how to write, you make friends there. Most of you remember your high school or your primary school for your friends, the time you spend. Uh, uh, and that's, that's mainly what we started. But of course, education is a huge, uh, plays a huge role in the lives of the, uh, of, the, of the children. Most of the children who are not studying now are either um, working. And child labor is big in Lebanon in most, in most areas where there's refugees. Um, and, um, and so education can be, an, can, be, can be an alternative for them. Education can give them alternatives for the future. Uh, so it became for more focused on education, but initially it was the social aspect of it. And it is needed for refugees because most, most refugees feel alienated when they move to other countries. So in order for them to care about education, they need to feel certain level of comfort. And that's what we try to provide for them first, and then we educate them. And here this week, you're a group of uh, the really younger generation that is here at the World Economic Forum in different fields. You represent different fields and you have different missions. What is your collective mission uh, as a group here? What do you want to achieve here? Yeah. Of which this panel is, is you know, one of the forum of the fora, yeah. in which you can do it. I mean, uh, after talking to all the other change makers that are here, uh, we have different ages from 17 to 19. I'm the oldest, probably I'm 19. Uh, I mean, we all want to focus on what we can do today in order to ensure that we have a tomorrow. But the focus is on today. We've been talking about it a lot that nowadays the narrative is that what we can do in five years. I mean, from government perspective, that's understandable. From business perspective, that's understandable. But from activists, we don't focus on that. We focus on what we can do today, because that's how time works. If we make today better, it's going to affect tomorrow, so tomorrow is going to be better. But the more we think about what's happening in five years, the more distracted we get. And that's what most of the young people are focusing on. And of course, we've been discussing a lot of climate change. This, it's such a crucial issue nowadays, and especially in the World Economic Forum, there's a lot of emphasis on it. And as a, as a refugee, there's a really important, uh, there's a really important issue where, when we work with the climate change, is that we can't I can't demand refugees to care about climate change because they would have to receive education first. And so considering that all the emphasis on this climate change from business to government, people are forgetting the refugees in a sense. They're forgetting the struggles refugees face, like finding education, like finding work. Uh, and you can't solve climate change if you don't solve those problems first because um, refugees... As you said, they make a huge, a huge part of the population around the world, and if we couldn't lift them up to a certain socioeconomic uh, level so they can start caring about climate change, we won't solve it. So what I would say that most of the change makers are trying to tell all businesses that don't get distracted. Yes, climate change is important, but don't forget that there's other sectors that still need investments, and big investments as well, in order for us to solve climate change, because everything is interconnected. 
Great. Yeah. Well, thank you. So, Sada, so I think Mohammed has really set the scene for us nicely. Um, and, he, you know, Mohammed just now was saying, was talking about, you know, what we do now will, will bring fruit, you know, over the next five years, say. It seems, in fact, that in, in an age of uh, polarized politics, of increased populism, that, in fact, both policy and public attitude uh, have actually gone in the wrong direction uh, over the last five years. Yes, I think there is a lot of discussion around, you know, where public attitudes are, but, you know, we know that the evidence is actually very different. Um, we hear a lot from politicians about the fact that they are responding with their policies to what the public wants, what the public feels. There's been a lot of work done by us, as, you know, many other organizations, that actually has documented that public attitudes are not as polarized as we think. Um, you know, we've done a lot of surveys in the UK, in Germany, um, in Sweden, you know, in a number of different countries, um, and so have other organizations that really demonstrate very clearly how, you know, you've got two extreme ends um, of about 20, 25% of the population, pretty much in every country that is the bracket, who are very um, supportive of, you know, migration and sort of, you know, human mobility, and, you know, another 20, 25% that is absolutely, you know, opposed to it, and is not going to really change, you know, <laughs> its mind very easily. But there is this, you know, an organization called uh, More in Common as defined as uh, um, conflicted middle or anxious middle that actually changes its mind very easily and very rapidly. So these attitudes are not fixed in time. They really change. And a tiny incident, a tiny, you know, happening in the media or, you know, in, 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 in an event can really swing them one way or the other. So there are a lot, you know, the public is a lot more influenceable than we think. The, these positions are not so polarized. Um, but, you know, of course, populist politicians are having a field day about stoking fears and, you know, really trying to manipulate what, you know, they say is public opinion, when we know that actually it's not the majority of public opinion. And I think there is a problem in terms of how we have gone as a community in trying to engage, you know, with this discourse. Um, you know, the title of this session is, you know, sort of myth busting or something like that. And I think there has been a lot of myth, myth busting that's been focused on evidence and providing data and, you know, sort of giving hard facts. And that doesn't work. And it really hasn't worked. And we know that you know, populists are in a way, winning the argument because they engage emotions. Um, you know, they really sort of uh, making their argument relatable, you know, to people's emotions, whereas we are not doing that. And for those who have actually done more work, um, in particular in Europe around this, we see that what really works is where you make this experience relatable to people. And it's not as much the experience of, you know, the refugees but in, or, you know, the migrant, but when you make it relatable to their own community, their own space, their own sphere, what they experience, you know, what others in that community have done, you know, the, how that contribution, how that local integration has really worked. So that's a lot of the work that we need to do because I think actually, you know, we can um, shift opinions more in a more solid way so that it's less, you know, volatile. So basically what you're saying is that the discourse ends up being almost a high-level one about, oh, all these people coming in and taking our jobs. In actual fact, if, you, if, if somehow experiences of local communities were able to emerge where in, in which you have, you know, migrants who have come to that community, and perhaps we can come back and talk about Sweden later, and, uh, you know, have integrated well are part of the community, are working, have, have filled jobs that exist because we were just saying yesterday, you know, we were on the U.S. economic panel, there was a lot of discussion about the fact that there are too many jobs that cannot be filled and yet we know what's happening in the border. So you're saying let's bear out kind of local reality might help. Uh, I can, the, can you tell us, can you give us some best practices around the world? Can you tell us where at the local or at the state or at the national level of any country there have been uh, propositive um, policies to help with the reskilling uh, and integration, reskilling, and employment of migrants successfully. I will gladly do so, but allow me just for a moment to preface my remarks because being from the United Nations, my colleague Filippo Grandi, who is the High Commissioner for mm -hmm. Refugees, would not forgive me if I slightly uh, take one step back and, and just remind ourselves that the conflagration of a refugee and a migrant is something that may speak to the life story of an individual, but it's very important that we remember that refugees are protected under international law in ways that migration 
is not covered and that migrants, in a sense, um, have a different um, background to it. Now, what is interesting in Mohammed's story is that, you know, your journey began as a, as a refugee and, if I understand it correctly, ended so far in being a migrant. And I think that speaks to part of the challenge that we face today, which is that, you know, what used to be in the past uh, more a phenomenon of uh, people moving because there was a demand for the labor market and there was a, a willing supply, uh, it was demand that dominated, so to speak, in the receiving countries, migration policies, but also migration flows. Today, in a much larger world population with many more crises, but not just the crises that are defined in terms of wars and conflicts and refugees, but also in you know, a report that UNDP put out last year called Scaling the Fences, we, we interviewed 3,000 illegal migrants in Europe to understand who are these people? Why are they feeling compelled to leave? And <clears throat> do they fit that category of these are the poorest, the most desperate people who are fleeing their country, so to speak? And that clearly is not borne out by this. And that's where you become very quickly uh, conscious of the fact that there are many tiers and layers to migration. I think the first thing is, and Mohammed spoke to just now, can you as a migrant find a more governed space in which your arrival is not one that begins with illegality? Because that already determines your entire scope for either being able to operate or not operate. And I think one of the things that we're witnessing right now is that we live in a somewhat schizophrenic moment. On the one hand, you know, even a region like Europe desperately needs people in order to run its economies. On the other hand, it is because of the refugee um, phenomenon in recent years, but also because of growing illegal migration, which is a product of not having good governance for migration, ending up in a situation where people do indeed feel pressured. And I don't mean those who have always disliked the foreign. I mean, these people you know, exist in our societies. They are thankfully a minority. They gain voice in those moments. But I mean, to your point, they then become, in a sense, more amplified in a sort of... Uh, you know, public debate about how, how much can we sort of take in in one go. Now, you asked me for practical examples, and I think the first thing that we have tried to understand better as part of also the UN looking at this phenomenon of migration, which is growing, which is why we also have a global compact on refugees and we have a global compact on migration. Interesting enough, the countries that are most agitated about refugees and to some extent migration were the ones who were least willing to acknowledge the value of actually trying to work together as an international community to address the phenomenon of migration. So the first challenge we have to address is one where um, we deal with the fact that people operate in a space of illegality. And if you want to start talking about livelihoods, about the ability of migrants not to be, as they are maybe in Europe, beneficiaries of a you know, social security welfare system, but the further south you go, they actually have to survive. There is no you know, social security welfare system, livelihoods become essential. And here, I think um, there are interesting new uh, domains in which opportunities arise, particularly in the kind of digital economy, in the global marketplace, the e-commerce platforms. And I'm always reminded of a very interesting moment when, um, you know, in Turkey, which hosts the largest number of refugees, but also increasing migration is a phenomenon Turkey has to deal with. Um, a woman who had been trained um, in a program that we put together um, to essentially produce jewelry that she could sell. And the question was asked by, by some, well, how many of you can be trained? I mean, there's only so much jewelry you can sell. And she said, you know, I, I live in another age. I have an Instagram account. I sell worldwide. And I think we, we, we need to begin to realize that there is, with the number of migrants that we have, an entire population that is often larger than most countries in the world in that sense, it's almost a migrant nation that is in need of being given opportunities with which to develop livelihoods, in which maybe an e-commerce identity becomes, uh, let's say, at least an intermediate step between having no identity, no rights, no ability to earn legally your livelihood, and ultimately becoming a legal migrant employed in you know, the labor markets of the country you're going to. And I think we have to explore these avenues far more quickly because the more we push migration into illegality, the more we actually produce the very situation that the receiving societies are essentially beginning to react to. And that is a focus of, of what, what we would like to see. The other part is obviously, can migration also become a more circular phenomenon? People largely are not happy to leave their country. 
and they feel compelled to do so. Again, the Scaling Defenses report is a very interesting insight into what drives people to pick up, risk their lives, and, and most of them say they would do it again, which is the other extraordinary phenomenon we found. But many of them also say, if I succeed, I would be the first one to envisage a future of going back. And yet that story of going back um, largely does not work, especially when migration is deemed illegal. And therefore, you are bound not to succeed in the way that would allow you to then go back to your country of origin at your own choice. You've said a lot, and I'm going to try to unpack sort of a few of the a, a, a few of, of the concepts. You know, one is the illegality, legality, and I think, um, you know, obviously, I think we would all agree on that. Perhaps we could move beyond the, um, the 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 illegality part because we're talking more about the legal the the realm of legality. I think now is is in in terms of the labor market, um, and it, and then you talked about the global marketplace, so implying that maybe. You know the laws of a country, such as Mohammed said. You know, in in Lebanon, one of the reasons he left is that by law he was only going to he and his cohorts were only going to be to to be able to enter certain types of of jobs. So, where does the responsibility lie? Is it a national responsibility within? So, is it a sovereign responsibility? Is it an international responsibility? Some kind of international compact, if that is ever possible, because as you said, countries that need it the most actually didn't want to collaborate. Does it lie squarely in the corporate sphere, in the private sphere? Where does this responsibility lie? And, and I think that's why I say let's move to the legality, because I think illegality and getting to legality raises a whole other question that perhaps is beyond the scope of, of this panel. Um, not that it's not important and it's a part of it, but, but where does the responsibility lie then in moving the refugee or the legal migrant into the workplace? I mean, I would. Mohammed, first. I mean, I would say, uh, like, for instance, what what's been uh, what's been happening in Lebanon on a really smaller scale, on a really small scale, but we're trying to expand it to other places as well, such as Sweden, for instance. What we're trying to, like, if we're going to talk, there's a, there's a huge responsibility lays with the private sector. The private sector, when they are investing in the education of refugees, they they us they usually invest in as uh, traditional education, but they don't include like uh, technological education, for example. Most in Lebanon, there's a certain NGOs, including us. What we do, we invest invest on those women or the children and teaching them a certain, if they teach, if they reach the specific level of education where they know how to read and how to write, we teach them English, that's for sure, and also sometimes coding. We teach them coding so they can, for example, in Lebanon, the law says nothing about coding. The, 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 the refugees, the legal refugees there, or if we're going to see them because the law in, in Lebanon see them as economic uh, migrants, does, it says nothing about working in coding online. It says nothing about working online. Even their simpler job is there's tech companies like uh, in Google, for instance, your, your job is basically going around and say, naming pictures. And then you get paid for if you said this is an elephant or this is a square. And refugees are working that and getting paid for that. So there's private, we need to shift how private sector invests in refugees in order for us to enroll those refugees in the modern economy because modern economy is hugely independent on online jobs nowadays. And refugees will be able to do so. Other than that, of course, it's a national level, but uh, in certain countries, the refugees lives, national levels are hugely impacted by international pressure as well, like in Lebanon. If, there's a, if there is enough international pressure on the Lebanese regulations uh, on refugees, there, will be, there might be changes. But that's not for me to talk about. So, Sada, you, you shook your head when we were talking about you know, illegality or legality. Perhaps you want to bring that. Uh, yeah, and also into... respond to your question, because I think you do need the public and the private to really work together <laughs> to address this, first of all, at a national level, and then that can become also a global response. Because I think part of the problem we have seen over the past, I don't know, five to six years when this has become such a polarized debate is that, particularly in Europe, we have projected um, a sense of unmanageability of numbers, which is absolutely not the case. Uh, but that's, the, you know, that's what is, is in a way, um, permeated you know, with the public. It's this, this perception that these numbers are not manageable. And this is the same time where actually the numbers are needed, the labor is needed in Europe you know, for all sorts of different reasons. So we see businesses actually asking you know, to have um, 
more flows you know, of labor into Europe because you know, it's required. And that's what worked in Germany, quite frankly, you know, because it was needed to have more labor for you know, German businesses. And German you know, private sector has actually cooperated really well. You know, there's a, a network of 300 you know, prominent businesses has really worked on you know, facilitating some of, of this integration. Uh, clearly, there is an investment to be made when you have such large flows at the beginning. But we know full well that in the space of five years, and you know, the projection is by 2021, Germany is actually going to see a benefit from this big investment that they have made you know, in welcoming so many refugees. So it's, it's really reframing you know, how we address the problem. Because if you actually look at the crude numbers, we were just discussing that at the beginning of the sessions, Europe has invested a massive amount of money in trying to block the borders. You know, Fortress Europe has spent a massive um, um, amount of money. And, and all it has achieved has actually you know, made journeys more dangerous for people. You know, migration is a fact of life. You know, since time immemorial, people will always find a way. They move for different reasons, you know, whether it's because of fleeing violence or because they're looking for a better job or better education. All of us on this panel have an experience of you know, mobility and working in another country because you know, we pursue certain aspirations. Um, that is not going to change. What has changed with the kind of policy responses we've seen so far is actually made it harder for the you know, cyclical migration, seasonal migration that many businesses have been relying on, um, for you know, those who were already migrants in those countries to have a better experience of integration. And I think you know, we really need to continue to work to reframing you know, the narrative so that the policies can become more conducive. Sorry? Um, we were going to leave the end for questions, um, uh, but go ahead, jump in. Why not? It's a small enough crowd that we can be fluid. Because I really like your argument. I mean, this is my seat. Angela Merkel said, "Wir schaffen das." She really tried to reframe it. She really saw the need for uh, uh, all the migrant workers, and it didn't work. It bounced back in her face because she didn't want it. What would you suggest the next politician to tell the person? Why do you say? Uh, people didn't want it. I mean, from what we have seen from you know, the analysis that's been done by many... Well, Angela Merkel wasn't liked in her country for that anymore. It didn't resonate with the country. I mean, I can you German, maybe you have a, a, a more direct view of this, but from the research that's been done on this, actually, there is a, you know, the, the, the flaws have brought results. You know, the businesses are benefiting from the labor that has arrived um, in, in Germany. I think locally there are very different experiences, but there are very positive experiences of integration in different parts of Germany. Again, I'm not an expert on you know, the, the, the country per se, but I've read and you know, sort of overseen enough research that shows that you know, the investment has been obviously heavy to start with, but it started to bear fruit. And yes, it, it is in the immediate um, term, it's very hard for you know, people to see such a large number arriving all at once. But if you invest, you see return. So you're talking about sort of impopularity at the political level, and you're talking about actual results at the business level. I mean, Achim, again, it, I almost go back to my original question, which is what has been a success? How do we measure success? You know, what are the... Um, the, the policy gaps that have been filled successfully, what are the business needs that have been filled successfully? Again, colleagues, I, I have to appeal to you to not co-mingle refugees and migrants. Mm -hmm. I, I really want to make that point because in Germany, it's a country that for 50 years has practiced migration on a significant level. It's an integral part of Germany's economy, of Germany's society. Some of the largest Turkish cities are in Germany. Um, you know, and I could go on in Bangladesh. Um, you know that Bangladesh earns $18 billion in remittances every year. The whole textile industry is $30 billion. So more than half of that is, again, earned by migrants legally working abroad. And, you know, the migrant economy is alive and well. And that's why I was a bit intrigued earlier on when you said, let's not focus about illegality or legality. I mean, not that I want to pursue at all a legal argument. But frankly speaking, Legal migration is not a problem. I'm a migrant. I have a G4 visa in the United States. I'm actually a migrant in the true sense of the word. That's not our problem. We have a great deal of migration. And, you know, it, it, it is the moments where there is, let's say, a concentration of numbers that peaks when suddenly the society that is at the receiving end may react. You just have to go to Ellis Island. Those who know the United States next to the Statue of Liberty is Ellis Island. 
where, you know, essentially one wave after another of migrants arrived in the 19th century and were documented and, you know, either sent back or allowed to come in. The storylines there of the migration waves, the diaspora, so to speak, um, are fascinating to study. But I go back to the Bangladesh example. I mean, the whole Middle East is a migrant economy, and it's functioning legally. It is a major economic boost to the region, but also the countries of origin. So my worry, first of all, is not the legal migration end of it, because, you know, that's functioning. We don't have a problem there. It is the people who have either to uh, migrate illegally because they feel compelled to do so, and we have to understand that better. That's part of the global compact of migration also. Unless we look at the drivers of migration and how the numbers are going to grow, because we're going to be 10 billion people soon, 2 billion people on the African continent. So if you think this problem is going to diminish, wake up. It's not. We need to look at migration as a way of managing both population expansion, but also economic divergence. And here, I think the solutions lie far more in a by design than by default approach. And I think Europe is learning a very painful lesson. First of all, it's kind of assumption that collectively we can manage any kind of inflow, be they now the short-term refugee inflows. But remember, refugees arrive not on the premise of coming to be members of the labor market in the country they are arriving in. They are there because they are fleeing, looking for protection. Protection is afforded them. The theory was that they will return. Now, I would love to hear, Mohammed, what your perspective is. I mean, you, you are now a global citizen, right? You are not the person you were at 11 years old in Syria. So this is another phenomenon we have to deal with. There are children being born to mothers who themselves were born in the Dadaab refugee camp in Kenya, Somalian refugees. This is triple life imprisonment. And think about this for a moment. To be the daughter of a mother who herself was born in that refugee camp, that means three generations, not being able to escape a maybe 20 square kilometer spot on the planet Earth because you're deemed a refugee with nowhere to go. Now, migration is a different conversation, and I appeal to all of you to not commingle them, because one, we will undermine the regime we have created to protect and save lives of refugees. On the other hand, we have a far bigger phenomenon we have to deal with, which is that people are mobile, especially in the economy of the 21st century, and that we need to create means by which both the opportunities in the digital economy, the e-commerce platforms, the new skills that are there, how can we invest in them to, in, to, to make migration principally one that, first of all, does not, um, you know, essentially impoverish the migrant, but also creates the stress that then makes the migrant an unwanted person in the society that has received him or her. And there, I think, we are not only looking at basic training programs, we are looking at fundamental shifts in policy, in the way we invest in migration, and also in the way we enable people who migrate to not have to take a decision that if you migrate, you've given up your home country forever. What is it that would make a person return to the country of their origin because they actually believe that the next step in their life is a future there? So I'm, I'm going to pass you for a second, but hang on, if I could just press you one second because yeah. w when I was saying before that we should, that I, I didn't want to go into a legal discussion I, about that, that was the, so I, I, I probably phrased it badly. However, now that you raise it, you know, if we're looking for answers, the, the answer to <clears throat> making, to legal, migration from illegal migration lies with governments, right? Like, I mean, it cannot lie anywhere. So, so we, shouldn't, we can't then talk about what business can do. We cannot talk about e-commerce. That decision as to whether a, somebody, a human being, is legal in a country or not, by definition, is, is, a, is, a national, is a sovereign or international decision, correct? Absolutely, but business absolutely plays so a role. So business can press, business can influence. Well, business is, is the labor market. Business mm -hmm. shapes immigration policy. Business provides investment opportunities into that migrant economy. I and mean, look at the voices in the United States right now. Look at them in Europe. I think business has an absolutely central role to play, legitimate as a stakeholder. In, in, that in creating, in, in saying they're in creating the demand that will then press policy. I just wanted to, because again, if we're looking for answers, we have to distinguish what is possible in the political sphere, what is possible in the business sphere, right? And so just as we need to make the distinction between legal and illegal, we ought to say the solution, it's useless if we say Microsoft has, high, has called for all these workers, if then the legal 
um, if the jurisprudence in that particular country will not allow them to, to do it. So, uh, sorry, Sara, and then Mohammed, and then we have a Very briefly, just yeah. to say, the business are expressing a frustration, you know, in the UK as in the US, because they don't see these safer legal routes, you know, for migrants to be able, you know, to go and contribute to the economies where, you know, there is a demand for labor. You know, just yesterday, the CEO of Microsoft said very clearly, you know, that, you know, the countries that are failing to attack, attract migrants will stand to lose, basically, economically, you know, long term. I mean, I'm, I, I think I'm too young to discuss. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've been trying to follow, but I think, like, fr from, from our experience, at least, the one, all, of course, business influence the policies that the government make, but also the, uh, the communities where the migrants, both migrants and refugees, but less specific on migrants. For example, the Palestinians, uh, the Palestinian refugees in Lebanon, that uh, we now we're seeing third generation of the Palestinian refugees, who still, as you've said, who still lives in the refugee camp, and they haven't moved out. Uh, but how, 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 were they, how they were able to integrate with the workforce is by integrating with the, with the community they live in. They were able to become, in a sense, li in, in a sense, they Lebanese. Of course, that prevents them from going back to their home country, other than that there is a conflict. Uh, but mostly, if we were going to focus on migrants, like in, in Sweden, for instance, uh, now we, there's a lot of discussion that Syria is going into a good place. We can argue that it's not really yes. Uh, but the why people are not going back because they are integrating in those communities that they live in. Because yes, if we want to focus on the workforce, of course they are, they might get in or not. But if we want to focus on the social aspects of it now, if people moved for year two, three, four years to a different city, they will become part of that city. So the question is how we can push the also the the local populations to, in a sense, push the the businesses or the or the policies maker to. Uh, to make specific policies in, uh, uh, from, the for, 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 from the ground. And we've seen this in Lebanon. Now, there's a, the protests that are going in Lebanon started with refugees protesting against the, migra against the, uh, the policies that are put on refugees or migrants in Lebanon. And now there they are almost a million persons on the streets taking the streets, and the government is changing its laws, and it did change its law. Uh, so also, if we both private and us here, if we can tell the stories of those people and we can invest on the local population as well. One of the things we do in actually in Gersi, in my school, is we also hire Lebanese. We don't only hire Syrians, even though we need to hire Syrians because there isn't Syrians hired, but we understand that if we hire Lebanese, we can integrate both communities and both communities can push the government to change their policies and the private sector as well. So. No, oh. that means I, I can go ahead because I saw yeah. I just, uh, yes, because I recognize so much what I saw in Beirut also and what Mohammed describes. Because, you know, depending on who you are in this drama that is playing out, I mean, first of all, you know, Libya, uh, uh, Lebanon, uh, Turkey, uh, Jordan, those are the countries who, in a sense, were the first point of refuge, so to speak, for Syrians. And they bore an immense brunt. I mean, I've seen schools in Beirut that now operate on three shifts in order to teach the Syrian refugee kids and also Lebanese kids, health posts. So your initiative is not only brilliant in terms of having taken initiative, it also helps the host country to start spreading that challenge. But I think um, I was very struck by when Mohammed described this reality that, you know, if you are a Syrian refugee in Lebanon today, um, and going back is, you know, either not happening now or unlikely in the near future, what do you then try to do? You try to create some kind of um, livelihood in existence. Now, in Turkey, extraordinarily, the generosity of Turkey allowed many of the refugees to become de facto migrants, in a sense. They were able to operate in the economy of Turkey. They were allowed to undertake activities. Now, in a country like Lebanon, the space is much narrower. The competition for jobs much higher. And I think one domain in which we do need to look very carefully is can we address this issue that a country that is receiving a lot of refugees or migrants is under pressure. It doesn't want to open its legal labor market immediately to that, maybe because of the reactions you might get in a country like Germany. Could a digital identity be a new platform on which you can create the possibility of having found refuge here or having found a place in which to land as a migrant, but not necessarily being able to work in that country as a German or a Brit or a, or a Lebanese. And therefore not perceived as, be perceived as a burden on exactly. that country's and labor the digital market. digital identity suddenly gives you a key to trade, to interact, to receive uh, money, to be financially viable. And this is a fascinating moment in time where the digital economy 
may in fact hold not, you know, it's not the Gordian knot that is suddenly cut, but it is a significant uh, illustration of what you were looking for. Are there ways in which we can deal with ever larger numbers of migrants who will land somewhere but may not be able to simply land into and a labor so market? Who, and I want to pass to the, if we could get a mic to the lady uh, in the fourth, third row. But, and so can you give, is there, who has done this well? What? Did, did well, we are just beginning to experiment. But I mean, uh, the lady who I spoke about earlier on who trades on Instagram is a great example. Um, eBay as a platform. But we are currently also working in Bangladesh with our colleagues in Bangladesh because, you know, the digital economy is a significant part of Bangladesh's sort of local infrastructure. How could we develop such models for the Rohingya refugees in, at the moment? Myanmar, you know, close yes. to a million people there. And, you know, Bangladesh is not a country that needs more labor. It actually is struggling with the population it has. So can one help the Rohingyas who are locked in a refugee camp to perhaps become economically viable in ways that we had not thought of in before. In ways that almost transcend national borders. Please, that third, third row and then in the first. Yes, hello, thank you very much. Uh, as a double migrant, this is a topic of particular interest. It would be great to hear the panel's thoughts with regard to the negative attitudes that surround migration, what your views are on the largely failed economic, neoliberal economic policies of the last 30 years, specifically austerity, which has ravaged nations over the last 10 years, coupled with the fact that Globalization has reaped tremendous rewards for a few at the expense of many, specifically workers' rights, and what your views are more on that macro context, which I think goes a long way towards explaining negative attitudes. Thank you. I'm going to get the three questions together because then we have to wrap up. Right here in the front and then right here. If you could keep your questions uh, quite pithy so that then the panel can answer. It's a question for, for Mr. Uh, Steiner. Uh, you underline we don't have to conflate uh, the refugees <laughs> and migrants. But how about people a little bit in the middle? And I'll, I'll give you an example. People coming from Libya, uh, it is always often very difficult to tell apart uh, which is which, and especially according to the kind of experience they've had uh, during the journey. So how about uh, the, uh, the legal tools to recognize the different layers? Oh. Uh, many people have been abused. And uh, about the digital identity. Uh, those people, like 50% statistically, it's K plus 5. It's K plus, K pl K plus 5. Another Ask the question, is sorry, because we have two uh, minutes and we have to eight. finish. So the reality is sometimes aren't, aren't they a little bit too complex? Great, thank you. And here, the last question, if we could pass here. And then you have sort of kind of a one minute each <laughs> to wrap up. Uh, thank you. My name is Nadia. I come from Yemen and I'm a researcher. My question for Sarah is ODI is a think tank and what are you doing in terms of advocacy for the information that you have, um, teaming with storytellers and so on. And for Steiner, it's about digital identity, but what about flow of money? So they cannot open a bank account where they can receive the money and so on. Great. Thank you. Okay. We're going to do a last round. We're going to start from the far end and this is your final remarks. So if you could try to incorporate the questions. A big question, obviously, on globalization and what is driving migration. I think um, in that larger drama that is playing out now, not just in terms of migrants, but in, in many societies, there is a fundamental questioning of what kind of economy defines what kind of society we want to be. So I think without having time to respond to now, there is a significant part of that that speaks to both in the countries that are debating migration at the receiving end, but also the countries that are dealing with being on the periphery of a global economy. And the Scaling Defenses report was very interesting because the people who actually are the illegal migrants to Europe are not the poorest. They are young. They are, on average, better educated than those we would associate with being the extremely poor. They are people who essentially have lost confidence in their future in their country being anything different from what they came from. And that is what is often driving, that, that lack of perspective and at the same time having the feeling that if only I can make it somewhere else, my future will be different. So it is a much more complex um, set of decisions that are playing out there. To the issue of um, the conflagration, as I said, I mean, you know, first of all, in the life of, of, of Mohammed, you have the beginnings of being a refugee, you become a migrant, and then you are one day maybe, you know, neither, because you're actually just a global citizen who is able to work across the globe because you're an attractive person. Just, um, sorry, there was one, one more question. Um, oh. Part of what is happening also with migration is this challenge that 
many of the illegal migrants who end up being illegal migrants in Europe try to come in as refugees because there is no legal way in which to actually say, can I come here and work? And so the default is you try and lie and cheat because it's the only legal avenue to get into Europe. And this is a contradiction that we have to deal with. Otherwise, we undermine both the refugee policies, the viability in our own receiving end of societies, and ultimately we're not dealing with something that actually Europe needs, which is migration. Sara. Very quickly to the inequality <coughs> question. Um, I think that's a, an incredibly important question because you know, the fears of that conflict in the middle I talked about cannot be easily dismissed. You know, inequality absolutely plays at the heart of it. The real pressures for people who are you know, at the bottom of the pyramid, they see the competition of you know, others coming in and competing particularly for less you know, skilled jobs or you know, areas where there is more competition in the labor market. So that is an issue for governments to address in the context of their own economies. And absolutely, we've seen the results of austerity that is influencing public perception towards you know, labor migrants as well and, um, and on that we do do a lot of work including on this issue um, not just all the research and the evidence we do but the way in which we use it and we do that at two levels first globally you know the eye engages a lot in a lot of the global processes we have you know seconded people to pretty much uh, work with the co-chairs for the global combat on migration have been con contributed to the global combat on refugees but we're trying to take these conversations a lot more at the country level because we see that what really works is the specificity of the conversations and actually you know bringing together actors in a much more direct way around the issues that are specific to their constituency. Thank you. Mohammed. the last word to you. I mean, really quickly, uh, I, I think the best way for us, as, as if, if we're going to talk locally, because that's what I work with, I mean, you can't mix oil with water. What you have to do if you want to integrate refugees to, all, to, the, to the workforce or to the local communities, you need to also integrate the local communities to live with the, community, uh, with the refugees or with the migrants. What we do in Sweden is we try to work with... The, like with the Swedish people who's lived there their whole life, so the citizens, we only work with them. We don't work any. We don't have any integration courses for the refugees. We only work with them so we can reshape the local communities to be able to host rest refugees and don't have this backlash about them when they came or the migrants. So we need to work on both ends in order f for both communities to be able to live together and both migrants and refugees. So that would be my. Perfect. And on that note, I think that certainly what this panel has shown is that there is no policy, international or national. There is no business, uh, in national or international, that can ever be a match for the power of the human spirit. So thank you very much. Thank you.